Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I bring you greetings in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. This is Olivet Bible Church in your house. And once again, we are said to have a glorious moment in the presence of God. So I urge you to come together with all members of your family, all those under your roof, as we dwell together in the presence of God. And for all those joining us through our other online media channels, we encourage you to engage us via our online chat room, even as the service progresses. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and your mercy, for seeing us through these days, and for bringing us to this point in time. As we gather this morning to worship you, we ask that your presence will prevail. We ask that you have express way in every life, we ask that your word will prevail in every situation. Thank you, mighty God, even as we pray Lord, in we the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We exalt you. We bless your name now and forevermore. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. I have no other God but you. God of everything 
God of everything, no one like you. You sit in the heavens and make the earth your footstool. You're the God of everything, no one like you. I bring greetings to you and your family in Jesus' name. Thank God it's another Sunday. Some two weeks ago, we started a teaching on stay with the tested and proven. Stay with the tested and proven. And then we took a break for the covenant service. And now we want to continue on that teaching and round off on it for this time. Stay with the tested and proven. Um, let's go back to our text. First Samuel 17. From verse 31 to 40. First Samuel 17. From verse 31 to verse 40. I read. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep your, his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its bed and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. The King James says, for I have not proved, proved them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. We also read from 1 John chapter 2, 
verse 24. 1 John 2, 24. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. It reads, Therefore, let that abide in you which you had from the beginning. If what you had from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. We read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Test all things. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. And finally, we read from Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Revelation 3, 10 and 11. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which, has, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this moment. The entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. Father, we submit to the counsel of your word. We submit to the counsel of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, shed lights in our lives. Give us grace to obey. Shift our wills. Enlighten us. Break the hard grounds in our hearts and in our souls. Flush out the idols in our souls that war against the knowledge of you. And let your name be glorified. We thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the first part of the teaching, we emphasize the fact that there is a confusing maze of information uh, that is coming to mankind in this generation. And um, uh, in this season, when the whole world is, is contending with a pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, even in that area alone, there is so much information that is pouring in. Now, but... Both in this situation that we are handling now and in any other thing to do with our lives and our affairs, there is a need for us to stay with what we have stayed, tested and proven in the Lord. That was the choice David made. He was facing the biggest challenge in his life, at least up until that time, Goliath. It was not just a challenge to David it was a challenge to the whole nation of Israel. And then when he decided to take on that challenge, Saul offered him his armor. But when he tested it, he said, this thing is clumsy on me. I cannot handle it. And he politely turned it down and went with what he had proven with God. And God gave him the victory. Now, uh, I ask again, has God not given you victory in the past? Has God not given you victory in the past? How did he do it? You see, certain things and patterns you've seen, certain ways God has dealt with you in the past have become patterns in your life. And I know God can always do a new thing. But those things you have proven of him, hold on to them. Hold on to them. And don't let the information and the waves that are coming in this season, all kinds of waves and new doctrines, strange doctrines that are coming, hyper grace doctrines and all sorts that are coming, don't let them sway you from what you have proven in the Lord already. Praise the Lord. Now, so, uh, we are saying stay with the tested and proven. Stay with what you have proven. And in that last teaching, we call to your remembrance the faithfulness of God. Stay with his faithfulness. God is faithful. The word of God, his promises. The word of God cannot fail. And as a matter of fact, in Isaiah 55 verse 11, God said, so shall my word be that goeth forth from out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and prosper whereunto I send it. So the word of God is proven in heaven. O oh God, your word is settled. Now stay in prayer. Stay in prayer. Hold on to the word of God, to his promises in your life. Those, every word of God is capable of self-fulfillment. And then stay in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Stay in prayer. 
prayer doesn't fail. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then sustain your hope. Keep your hope alive and vibrant. Hope does not disappoint us. Romans 5 5. Proverbs 23, verse 18. There shall surely be an end. And your expectation, that's your hope, shall not be disappointed. It shall not be cut off. Now, stay with love. Keep loving. Keep loving even when your love is tried. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8 says that love never fails. Love never fails. A lot of things can fade away, but love never fails. At the end of the day, love will win. Galatians 5, 6 tells us that Love enables our faith. It enables the working of our faith. And then, we talk about faith. Stay in faith. Be steadfast in your faith. Don't be shaken. We live by faith, not by sight. Our faith has seen us through in the past. And it will see us through even in the present distress and whatever we face in future. He that is born of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith, that confident trust in the, in the Lord and in his word will always see us through. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we don't see. See, persist in faith, for the just shall live by faith. And the Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith, where which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Then the blood of Jesus Christ, treasure the blood, honor the blood, the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. The blood of Jesus is as fresh as ever. It's as fresh today as it was the day it was shed, presented in the, or before God in heaven, in the altar in heaven, and was accepted as sufficing for, the, for every problem that came to mankind. The blood is potent today as ever. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Jesus is our Passover. Stay in praise. First Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice evermore. That's, keep radiant in the spirit. Romans 12.11 says, Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Be, maintain the glow in the spirit. Be vibrant in the spirit. Let nothing weigh you down. If Satan cannot steal your joy, he cannot plunder your goods. Pray without ceasing. Sing to your sense. I mean, praise. Praise God. Make that an attitude of life. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. That's one reason the Jews praise him over and over again without getting tired. So, uh, the Bible says that singing to yourselves in hymns and songs and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, and so on and so forth. They remember grace. Second Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Grace is the most powerful force on earth. I know that people have brought teachings that push grace beyond what it is really. But grace is a powerful force. It's the force that can change a robber in that instance. Instant from being a robber to becoming a saint of God by actually changing his life, not by pretending or just making over something. Praise God. Now, we are going to go now into the, second, the, 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 the next segment of this teaching. Beware of information overload. Remember, we are saying stay with what you have tested and proven. Beware of information overload. There is a danger of information overload in our time. Look at Daniel chapter 12. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. 12, 4. It says, Of the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Until the time of the end. Until the end time, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. He's telling us, revealing several millennia ago, what will be in the end times. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall Increase. One translation says, knowledge shall be multiplied, or knowledge shall multiply. And I prefer that translation, 
But because knowledge is not just increasing in a incremental terms nowadays, it's, it's multiplying. It's in exponential dimensions. Now, look at also, as we take off in this now, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. It says, And Father, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is weariness to the flesh. And Father, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is the weariness of the flesh. Now, where we read in Ecclesiastes, in uh, Daniel, rather, chapter 12, verse 4, the Bible captures two things that we, that we characterize the end time. Among other things, we read in other places. Number one, increase in movement of people. Number two, increase in knowledge. Let's talk about increase in movement of people. Increase in human movement. It says many shall run to and fro, back and forth. In those days, communication was by actual movement of people from one location to other. Information was transported by the actual movement of people from one place to another. And communication, therefore, was by actual movement of people from one place to another. Up until the time of Jesus and beyond there, that was the means of communication. To move the gospel, to move any information from one place to another, actual human beings had to move between those places. So, um, the apostles, in a short period after the death of Jesus Christ, were able to cover the known world with the gospel. The known world then with the gospel. And the reason was... Um, because travel was made easier. It was enhanced by the peace there was under the Roman rule. The Roman rule maintained peace by force so that uh, 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 highway relays and all those things were virtually eliminated. So it was easy for people to move from one place to the other and so that was the way the gospel was moving then. Now, this prophecy of many running to and fro in the end time is fulfilled not only in enhanced movement of people. Now, those people can easily move from one place to the other. Uh, within what would have taken like a year, a voyage from here to America, that could have taken a year by the ships that were in 2,000 in, in 2, years ago, can just take like eight hours now. So you can move back and forth. It's easier. There are supersonic planes and all those things that make movement a lot easier. But beyond actual movement of people, I, I, I understand, I, I know, God, God began to show me that, that people shall move to and fro. He's talking about enhanced communication. Right now, there is virtu the, the, we have virtual reality in every field. You can hold a conference now with somebody in any part of the world, see the person, the person sees you, you pass information live without actually being there. That's enhanced information. That's still people moving to and fro. That's communication. It has become a lot easier. And that's one of the end time prophecies that was made uh, by Daniel about the end time. Daniel said a lot of things concerning the end time. So, beyond the movement of people back and forth resulting from enhanced means of transportation. That movement to and fro symbolizes breakthrough in communication. Quick goes beyond actual movement of people. At no time in human history has communication been easier than now. All sorts and many, so many channels and more are coming out. Let, let's talk about the second part of it. It says, and knowledge shall be multiplied, or knowledge shall increase. It's an information tsunami in our time. It's an it's our experience in this generation. Information or knowledge has always increased with time. Even for a child that is growing, with age, he increases in knowledge. In the human race, in, knowledge has always increased. Man has always added to what he knows. There was a time man thought that the earth was flat. 
with time, they realize that the earth is spherical. So knowledge increases, and we come up with new facts and realities. Knowledge is always on the increase. But the remarkable thing about our time is that it has moved from the incremental to the exponential. It's an explosion of knowledge in our time. It's a present-day reality, so much so that our time is referred to as the information age. So we are actually the generation, without referring to the book of Daniel, those that people have seen the volume of information and knowledge come being churned out in our generation, and they have called this generation the information age, without knowing what Daniel said. And that's, bring, that's the end time. We are in the end time. All the signs are obvious. Every prophecy is being fulfilled in our time. Then Jesus said that when you see all these things, wars, rumors of wars, famines, and all these things, increase in knowledge, increase in movement and communication, working together at the same time, he said you should know that the time is near. When you see all those signs working together, you can't take one of those signs and say that that's it. But in our generation, all those things are coming together. The end is very near. So this information explosion, knowledge explosion, is an affirmation to the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Now consider this. Consider this. Talking about increase in knowledge. Up until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. That is every 100 years approximately, what man knew doubled up until 1900. By 1945, that's at the end of the Second World War, human knowledge was doubling every 25 years. You see an acceleration. Now, by 1982, by 1982, human knowledge was doubling every 12 to 13 months. It's like every year, human knowledge doubled. And then by the time we came to 2018, human knowledge was almost doubling every day, every 24 hours. Now, in the 1980s, IBM had projected that in 2020, human knowledge will be doubling every 12 hours, resulting from the build-out of the Internet of all things. The Internet of all things. He said they projected then that knowledge will be doubling every 12 hours. You will see a lot of this information in Buckminster Fuller's book, The Critical Path, published 1982. Now, this volume of information coming to mankind comes with a lot of problems. I don't want to delve into discussing the problems in details here now. But in a general sense, there is an information overload. There is an information overload. Information is coming to people at a faster rate that, than they can process and sift what is wheat and what is chaff and know what is junk and what is reality. And amongst the things that are reality and that are good, what will, it, what will help my cause? Everything, the Bible says that all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are not beneficial to us. Even amongst the all things that are lawful, it's not everything that is useful to us. And so you can see what is happening even in this matter of COVID-19. Anybody can stay in a corner of his room or anywhere and just record something, whether it's true or false, and just send it on the internet and before you know it, it goes viral. And so information is pumping out to the extent that some people are even confused about how to go about the COVID-19 or even don't know what to believe. This is one instance. So all kinds of information flying all over the place, creating confusion, fear, panic, and distraction. Anybody can publish anything nowadays and it goes viral. And by the time they are publishing it, they will start from one person, two people. The people in their circle of influence, they say, make sure you, you send it to your contacts. Make sure it goes viral. And so everybody is churning out information, churning out information, authorized and unauthorized. 
What should we do then? What should we do? Number one, avoid the clutter. Avoid the clutter. A clutter is a confused, disordered jumble of things. If, you're, if you have a challenge, for instance, and you call 15 friends for a solution, and they give you 15 good solutions to the problem, you're already confused. I'm talking of 15 good solutions. Even if none of those solutions is bad. But you have 15 different options to choose from. You already, you already have a problem. Now think of the volume of information coming to us, knowledge in every area. And even when you don't want these things that are just popping up on your, your system, that, that are sending to you, them to you on all your platforms, on all your devices, that are coming. So this information overload is coming with so much confusion, uncertainty, ambiguity, and complexity. It's already a struggle on our part to make sense of it all. We're saying, what do we do then? This increase in knowledge comes with so much junk and so much that is negative. And remember, please, the quest for knowledge has always led man astray. When it's not tailored in the right direction, it has always led man astray. People have entered wrong societies because of quests for knowledge. One of the temptations that, that the serpent offered to Eve, projected to Eve, that she fell for was knowledge. This tree, if you eat of it, you, it, will, it, it will make you wise. And you will know like God, knowledge. And she fell for it. Remember Ecclesiastes 12, 12. Of the writing of many books, there is no end. And too much study is the weariness of the flesh. So, what do we do? Get pointed in your pursuit of knowledge. Organ reorganize yourself. Pause and reorganize yourself. Get pointed in your pursuit of knowledge. Some years back, God spoke to me and said that I should narrow down my reading now. A couple of years back, he said I should narrow down my reading. Trim me down to a certain point. What of wisdom? Knowledge is about acquisition of information. Knowledge is about accumulating facts or information. Increase in knowledge does not necessarily mean increase in wisdom. This tsunami of information in our time has been without increase in, knowledge, in wisdom. Man is not increasing in wisdom commensurately to the volume of information and knowledge that is coming to him. As a matter of fact, men are increasing in foolishness. That's the fact. And you will see it in every facet of society. Even scientists acknowledge that fact. That while knowledge is growing exponentially among men, wisdom is not. And wisdom is the principal thing. In reality, wisdom is on the decline. It's declining. Tim Sando, in an article in Digital Journal of November 23, 2018, wrote this. This additional knowledge does not necessarily mean we are becoming wiser. And the impact will affect businesses, universities, and governments. That's what he wrote there. It will not only affect these areas. He talks of businesses, universities, and governments. It's affecting families. It's affecting marriages. It's affecting everything man is involved in. There's a shortage of wisdom. So, this decline in wisdom is evident in the behavior of man in this generation. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. You see them saying it without uttering it in words everywhere that there is no God. The behavior of modern man is declaring there is no God. We can do what we like and get away with it. We are not responsible to any person. Everything is good as long as that's what we want to do. 
God has never run his creation that way. And he won't run it now like that in our generation. And so man is attracting a lot of problems to himself. So avoid the clutter, number one. Number two, that's what shall we do? Avoid the clutter. Number two, stay with what matters most. Stay with what matters most. Trim your studies down to a vital few. Stay on that which has been proven in all ages. Stay on that which is relevant and significant to your pursuit in life. I told you a story the last time. Albert Einstein was teaching in a class and somebody asked him for his phone number and he went to his diary to pick his phone number to show him. The person was surprised. Those around were surprised that he didn't have his phone number in memory. And they asked him. He said, what I can keep in a book, I don't need to put on my mind. So he frees up his mind for creative thinking. By the things some people forward to you, I know that totally distracted. Because I don't see how those things are building their faith. And I don't see how he's building their career. It has nothing to do with their pursuit in life. And yet they're turning on, forwarding all kinds of things. If those things that are forwarding to me to read are the things they read, then they're already out of focus. They're distracted. It's easy to get distracted. A man said in the Bible, as your servant was busy here and there, the man you told me to keep escaped. Busy here and there. And vital things escape. Stay with what matters the most. What knowledge then should we focus on? Number one, know God. Know God. Know God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. To glory means to boast. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich, the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Let him know, let him know, let him that glories or boast, boast in this that he knows me, that I am Jehovah, exercising loving kindness, but also exercising judgment. God will always judge sin. There has not been any generation since the time of Adam that has been blessed by sin. Not one. No matter how you try to rationalize it, God will always judge sin. Not one generation has been blessed by sin since the time of Adam. So he's not going to bless this generation in their sin. He's not going to bless them with their sin. He will always judge sin and the sinful way. He said, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. God delights in our knowledge of him. Habakkuk 2 verse 14 says, the whole earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what God wants to see on earth. He wants the whole earth covered with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the seas, as the waters wrap the seas. Most of the land on earth is covered by water. That's the way God wants the whole earth to be covered with the knowledge of his glory. That's the will of God. Daniel 13 I mean, Daniel 11 verse 32 says, those that do know their God, the B part, it says those that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The knowledge of God will make you strong and you will do exploits. Those that serve the devil and know him in depth are also strong in their own way and they do certain exploits, damaging exploits, destructive exploits. But those that know Jehovah, those that know the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, 
shall be strong. Those that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. Proverbs 4, verse 20, down to 23. You see God appealing to us. My son, attend to my words. Pay attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them. And health to all their flesh. Seek the knowledge of God. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. We read the first three verses. The knowledge of God. Pursue the knowledge of God. Seek to know God. Seek to know him. Seek to know him. When you know God, whatever else he wants you to know, he has a way of getting you to know it. But make the knowledge of God your primary pursuit. Not just head knowledge, not just theological knowledge, but know God experientially. Know him in fellowship. Know him in person, in a personal walk with him. Know God. Hosea 6, 1 to 3 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has turned, but he will heal us. He has stricken, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. He said, let's pursue the knowledge of God. He will surely show up as we pursue him. Let's pursue the knowledge of God. Let's pursue the knowledge of God. Look at what Paul has to say. After several years of knowing Christ and being in ministry, of serving him, look at what he has to say in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10, 9 and 10. Paul says, by the Holy Spirit, he speaks, and, he, and be found in him. Okay, let me take it from verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of faith, but that which is true faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, that I may know him. That was the pursuit of Paul, even at that point. So, focus on the truth. Focus on the truth. The word of God. You see, facts come in many forms and colors, but truth is unique and constant. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Focus on your God. Heed his warning in places. Don't study after strange gods to the extent that you know so much about them. In Deuteronomy 12, 30, God says, don't even try to find out how they worship their God. In Revelation 2, verse 24, God makes us to understand that it's an advantage not to delve into the deep knowledge of Satan. There it says, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have those, this doctrine, who do not know the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no other burden on you. Praise God. So we said, what knowledge should we pursue? Number one, pursue the knowledge of God. Seek to know God. Number two, we are saying, <laughs> avoid the clutter. And then, Focus on what is needful to you. Stay with what matters most. 
Stay with the, pursuing the knowledge of God. Number two, know your job. Know your job. Be sound in your skill and profession. Be sound in your career. Study to be sound in your career. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Study to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Paul wrote this to Timothy, a pastor. But that same advice applies to all, whatever your vocation is. Be diligent, study, to present yourself, approved to God, a, a worker that needs not to be ashamed. You know your trade. Proverbs 22 verse 29 says, do, do you see a man diligent and skillful in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Hallelujah. Do you see a man diligent and skillful in his business? He said that man will stand before kings. He will serve kings. He will, he will deliver service to kings. He will not stand before obscure men. So what do you do? The information that is available now across us ample opportunities to update ourselves in vital areas of pursuit. You can't avoid the tsunami of information and knowledge coming. But you need to be wise and behave like the old wise cow. When you go out in the field, be wise enough to know to eat the grass and leave the sticks. Sift what you take. Pursue things that are relevant to you. One area you must work on and you must seek to improve on is your skill, your profession, your career, whatever it is. In Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says there, Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says here, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So, wisdom, understanding, knowledge will help you to build your enterprise. It's, it's, it's very wonderful the way the Living Bible puts it. It says, any enterprise is built by wise planning. Become strong through common sense and profit wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Keeping abreast of the facts. Updating yourself in knowledge in that area of your enterprise. Are you still there? Updating yourself, what you know in your area of enterprise. If not, you will go obsolete. You will go obsolete and your, what you knew five years ago may not even serve you today in that area of pursuit. Knowledge is dynamic. So we must know how to navigate through the maze of knowledge that is coming our way and take what is needful. So it's easy to increase your knowledge now, but you must be sure and be careful about the area you're picking up knowledge. Know your God. Know your skill. Know your career. And there is available information. It's so, it's so handy now to help you in these areas of pursuit. In our time, knowledge is so dynamic. You must keep pace with skills and knowledge relevant to your vocation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Knowledge fades away. Now, in the Amplified Bible, that latter part says, whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away, it will lose its value and be superseded by truth. New, fresh knowledge will always displace what people knew prior to this time. The half-life of knowledge or half-life of facts is the amount of time that has to last before half of the knowledge of facts in a particular area is superseded or shown to be untrue. That's the way Wikipedia defines it. We talk of the half-life of batteries and so on. It's the time that elapses before half of its energy is drained or gone. So knowledge in the same way has half-life. 
and the half-life of knowledge, that's the time it takes for it, for half of what you knew to elapse, or knowledge available in a certain area to elapse, is decreasing, is becoming shorter and shorter because of the volume of fresh knowledge and so on being churned out. For example, Shane Parrish, in the book, Half-Life, The Decay of Knowledge and What to Do About It, writes, why figures for the half-lives of most knowledge-based careers are hard to find? We do know the half-life of an engineering career. A century ago, it would take 35 years for half of what an engineer learned when earning his degree to be disapproved or replaced. 35 years for half of what an engineer learned while earning his degree for it to reduce to half or be, be replaced by new truths or displaced. It will take 35 years, a century ago. By the 1960s, that time span shrank to a mere decade. In 10 years, half of what he learned that ending his degree is already obsolete, superseded, or replaced by new truths, new things coming out. And modern estimates place the half-life of an engineering degree between two and a half years and five years now. In other words, a person that graduates with an engineering degree today, it will take two and a half years to five years for half of what he learned in school to be replaced by new truths or disproved, to be made obsolete or disproved. So knowledge, that's the impact of the tsunami of knowledge that is coming our way. The half-life of knowledge is decreasing. And so we must continually update ourselves in relevant areas. Remember, we are saying stay with what you have tested and proved. But there are part of staying in that area is that you must be update, updating yourself and upgrading yourself in that area that is relevant to your pursuit. And we are emphasizing two areas, knowledge of God and your career. Now, he also noted, he said the problem is that we are rarely considering the half-life of information. Many people assume that whatever they learned in school remains true. Years or decades later. And that's not true. And so what do we do? We must apply the wisdom taught us in Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. He says, every enterprise, any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. You must keep updating yourself so that you can remain relevant in that area. You must keep pace with knowledge in your profession and vocation. And you see, even in our pursuit of the knowledge of God, you see, the, the, a lot, the, 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 the volume of knowledge and information that is coming away has made it a lot easier. Softwares have made it much easier for us to navigate through the Bible, to search out things, to find out meanings, and so on. More than ever before, the, knowledge, the pursuit of the knowledge of God is easier. And, but there is also a difficulty we face, and that still has to do with this tsunami of information. So much information is coming away that there is so much distraction. People are not focusing on the pursuit of the knowledge of God. There are people that will not miss one, the, the, the game of one player, just one superstar in football for one, for one season. And how, how I go miss this so and so. But now, all those footballers are in hiding. And there are no tournaments. Have you not missed them? But there is something that is constant. Why the whole earth is in hiding? Our God is working mightily. God is the only constant. His word is the only constant in the whole realm of creation. Careers have stopped. Tournaments, football tournaments, all kinds of tournaments, basketball, all of them, Olympics, everything has been postponed. But our God is working mightily in the midst of his all. He's the only thing constant. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word 
shall not pass away. In conclusion, in conclusion, what are we saying in effect? The volume of information flooding mankind can be very harmful. Stay with what you have tested and proven. That's what David did. That was his wisdom that helped him to conquer Goliath. He didn't go to the, that battlefield to try a new thing. He stayed with what he has tested. But I tell you, even that is sling, that is sling that gave him that slingshot that brought down Goliath, he can update it and get a better version of that sling. Eh? Okay? Now, streamline your quest for information, for knowledge. If you don't streamline it, you'll be picking on anything that comes. And the tendency is that those things you're picking here and there will dilute the vital areas you need to pursue. To pursue. Some others will take you out of focus, distract you completely. Build your knowledge with focus in two areas. Knowing God, knowing your career or profession. Any other thing you need can come to you. The God has a word bring, letting you know this, what is happening here and there. By way of current affairs and all those things. If you do this, you will do well. An object that will fly high must be light and must be pointed drop the weight of information overload and you will do better. Hallelujah. God bless you. Knowing God is knowing him experientially, not just cramming things about God. It's not knowing about him, but knowing him as a person. You can't know me. You can know my name, know uh, my occupation, know what I do, know the name of the church I pastor. And so when they ask you, do you know Owen? You say, yes, he's a pastor. I know even his wife. That's, you know about me, you don't know me. If you want to know me, you have to come closer to me. If possible, live with me. You can't know God by knowing about him. That's not knowledge of God we are talking about. We are talking of knowing God experientially. And it starts with receiving and knowing Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. It's not just about joining a church as a means of getting saved. No church can save you. The Bible says, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. God says, that's my, that's my party. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and make salvation through Jesus Christ a reality. Are you ready to do that now? Now say this simple prayer with me. Say, O God of heaven and earth, I come before you now. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I've heard your word. The good news is that you have already paid to save me. I believe that Jesus came to this earth he died on the cross, shed his blood for me as a person. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you died on the cross for me. You went to hell for me. You were buried. You rose the third day. Because you rose, you can give me a new life. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord. And my personal savior. From this moment on, we shall be one. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I now want to pray for you listening and watching this message. It takes wisdom and understanding to reorder things. No man continues doing things the same way and expects a different result. You're not being truthful to yourself. Something has to change if you're going to get pointed in your pursuit of knowledge. If you're going to get the knowledge that will be relevant and significant in your pursuit in life, you need to get pointed and trim off some things. 
Now I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you said in your word that wisdom is the principal thing. I ask that you release your wisdom over this one in the mighty name of Jesus. And I declare over you listening to me, may the wisdom of God come to you expressly. May he open your eyes to the revelation he's passing across to you now. And help you know what is important and what you need to drop even right away. May the Holy Spirit work mightily in your heart to sift what you are pursuing in life. I ask that the Holy Spirit dry the appetite, the desire for any knowledge that is not helping your cause. Any knowledge that is leading you out of the track. No matter how good it is. Anything that is making you unproductive in life. Any pursuit of knowledge that is making you unproductive in life or leading you in the wrong direction. I ask that the Holy Spirit moves in now and sifts that knowledge and removes the appetite for such pursuits from you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, point your people. You said that you, we will hear a, a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. May we hear your voice this season, showing us the way we must go in the pursuit of knowledge. In the pursuit of knowledge and in the handling of the maze of information and knowledge that is coming our way. Show us, trim us down to pursue what you make us pointed and get us to fly higher in life and in the knowledge of you. This I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I release your healing power over that family. I release your healing power over that person. Anyone that is sick now, feeble, weak in the body, going through pains. Father, let the power of your Holy Spirit envelop that family. Suck away that pain and destroy the power of that sickness. In Jesus' name, I release life into your home. I release life into your home. Receive strength and power. May your hope be revived. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Don't count on what you have built in the area of knowledge prior to now. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, told us the kind of knowledge he had acquired and the heights he had attained to. But he said he came to a point in his pursuit of Christ that he counted all those things as dung, rubbish. And he focused himself on the pursuit of Christ, the knowledge of Christ. And this is what God expects all of us to do. Do it and the Lord will bless your pursuit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us in the service today. We believe you've been blessed by that word of God. And we encourage you to make good use of every opportunity you have with the word of God by putting it to work. For further inquiries and prayer requests, you can contact us via our details displayed on your screen right now. You can give your offering and tithe via our account details displayed on your screen. Let's pray over our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for your word that we have heard. Thank you, O God, for every hand that is lifted up this morning. As we give this offering, we declare the goodness of heaven and above, the abundance of the heaven and of the earth beneath up over our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.